and make the finals and drop to SKT. Make the finals and not have to play SKT. So thankfully they won their final matchup this time around to take the number one seed. And Edward Gaming had the best regular season record of any professional team this year. And now they're in this stage of the number two seed in this quarterfinal match. And there's a few things I really want to hit on in the pick and ban phase. I love the Elise ban from EDG because Peanut really crushed on that jungler towards the end of the group stage. I also expect more jungle bans to follow. I think Elise and Nidalee are big bans for EDG, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Rox ban Syndra because of the mid lane pressure that could have for Scout. And that's kind of the unique thing that Rox Tigers get the flexibility of, is that two jungle bans is almost always the norm against this team. In 2016, Peanut is 12-0, undefeated Nidalee, 25-2 on Elise. They so often yeah. first pick one of those two champions if they're available. EDG's done their research, but on the analyst desk, they were talking about the Rek'Sai point as well, and Rock Tiger's banning it away on blue. Yeah. It's a champion they kind of default to, but not one they find big success on. Yeah, to me, the fact that Rock's first picks the jungler actually goes to show how important it is the peanut can dictate the flow for this team. Most teams try and play League of Legends through vision control and pressure in the mid lane and then work outwards. But the Rocks Tigers actually have a mid laner who absorbs pressure. They put Peanut on an aggressive jungler and they try and win through the top and bottom lane and then collapse that pressure to the mid lane. So these picks and bans make a decent amount of sense coming in here. Double jungle ban, no cannon ban, which surprises me, and a first pick, Caitlyn. I really like the first pick, Caitlyn. That's actually the pick that uh, H2K used to so much success against EDG twice on the last day of groups, beat them also in that first seed match as well. It feels like EDG have gone laning focus. Why they played Nami five out of seven games, going for that laning power. Not many AD carries, not even many duos can stand up to the Caitlyn. Yeah, and I do also think though, because of the final Jin ban, they were kind of hoping that Rox would go with the bottom lane like that, because the trade back power of being able to get Ryze and Olaf too often ban champions as we progress later on in this tournament, especially when you have a triple ban in the jungle already, is relatively valuable for EDG. And one thing I love about Worlds is every year, tournaments become sleeper picks and become higher and higher priorities throughout the weeks to come. Zyra has been picked now, what, five games in a row in the quarterfinals, this lane dominant bottom lane sort of style, right? The first pick, Kaylin, the Zyra to, to go in, uh, aside next to it. The two longest range auto attackers you could pick for these roles, and it's it's Rox Tigers hoping to completely push out and smash this bottom lane. Yeah, we saw a lot of Zyra versus Karma support matchups yesterday. I think the trend will come over here as well. Karma gives Ezreal some pushing ability, you know, the Mantra Q, for example, onto the minions. So they've gone for Ezreal Nami so many times and lost with it frequently. At least Karma has the shove that Nami does not. Yeah, and also Karma has a little bit more poke potential if you can weave the Qs through the plants. Uh, the rest of this draft phase will be really interesting, though, because we already have the rise in the mid lane for EDG, meaning they are going to counter pick for their emergency sub, and they leave Rocks a lot of freedom with their solo lanes right now. You see, the most pressure top laner you can select in the Jace. A lot of kill pressure, a lot of push pressure, perhaps a rumble to stand up to it. It looks like we might actually see Korra consider that, even though it's not in his traditional wheelhouse, that information, very outdated, six-month-old information on Korra. Exactly. Korra hasn't been playing for EDG, but it's not like he hasn't been playing League of Legends and keeping up with what champions he should be picking in the top lane. Rumble can actually shove Jason in the very early levels, uh, but after Jace gets some magic resistance, you lose kill pressure and it becomes more of a team fight pick. So I hasn't locked it in yet, though. Exactly. And you were talking about tournament metas, Freak, even series meta, because what we see from Kuro is he often reaches for these new picks. Sometimes, like, the victory innovates them, but frequently, we saw his attempt at Syndra early in this tournament wasn't convincing. He's played one game ever on Aurelian Soul back in the LCK, wasn't convincing. So if he can actually start to draw, Bans on Aurelian, so on those champions, not like his Victor, for example, that is much more well known for, that pinches the ban pool even more for EDG. Yeah, and I'm really curious to see how effective his Aurelian Soul is because he was one of the first players to actually pick it in Korea, but it didn't become one of his mainstay picks. It does have the potential to solve the problem of them not having strong mid lane control. Because Aurelian Soul can shove up so quickly and then look to roam, it can be effective, but it's dangerous if Peanut cannot get the proper ward control for Kuro's mid lane. And let's consider the effective champion pool usually of Kuro, Victor and Varus. Wave clear, but not necessarily roam champions. We do not often talk about Kuro and Peanut roaming as a duo. So the question mark remains, will this be a good fit for the Rocks Tigers draft? 
always going to be a question that they can answer with their game plays to get a shot of the wonderful crowd here in Chicago cheering on which teams they want to win. And I got to say some phenomenal camera shots here. So we are getting ready now for game one of our third quarterfinal match. The right to play SK Telecom T1 in the semifinals. And people in the stands and people at home can cheer on your favorite team. Make some noise on Twitter or here in the stands. Hashtag rocks win. Hashtag EDG win for which squad you want to come out on top. Is it going to be the number one team from South Korea or the number one team from the Chinese LPL to get ourselves in? Yeah, and you can actually see a fair number of EDG signs in the crowd. That team actually travels quite well as far as their fan base. But looking at these team compositions very early on in the game, the worry for EDG is that they're not going to have enough pressure in their lanes. Rocks Tigers have managed to pick a very strong bottom lane, a pushing mid lane, and once he gets a few levels, a pushing top lane. And that'll make it very difficult for Clear Love to make things happen on Olaf. I think that's so important, Jap, because the Olaf in particular has been best used with pushing lanes, early invades, say, stealing away a blue buff from a jungle that's been trying to pass it off at level four. I feel like if you're getting pushed in, Olaf's just power farming. He's not as strong. It's all about the skirmish with Olaf, so they'll need to really find some lane pressure to really facilitate Olaf at its maximum capacity. And the way this game goes is really going to tell us a lot about the rest of the series, because at least during the group stage, EDG didn't really seem to have a true identity. The biggest example of that was that Clear Love played seven different junglers in the seven games he played. Olaf, now the first jungler, he is repeated to play at Worlds. And then you talk to analysts, and they're like, wow, Rocks looked like themselves two games right at the end of the group stages. No coincidence, first picking Elise in both of those games. The ultimate comfort, 27 games on Elise from Rocks Tigers this year already. And of course, you saw Edward Gaming ban away those favored peanut champions, the Elise, the Nidalee, the things that he has such an amazing win rate on. And the question really does come up, are we going to see the last two games Rocks Tigers or the entire first week and a half Rocks Tigers? And the same for EDG. This is a squad that dominated China and then lost to EULCS's number three team to, to take the number two seed out of the group. And the real question is, which form of these two teams shows up today? I mean, the simple storyline is which sleeping giant wakes up today because both these teams were supposed to go far, but only one will make semifinal. And you can already see the battle over wave pushing in this bottom lane. Mako's been very accurate with his cues, so the first wave actually clears at the same time, but you still expect the Zyra and the Caitlyn to be able to shove out. Whoever can get level two first may actually get the advantage in this lane. Let's track it. We've even seen Gorilla hope for some fortunate plant spawns. The passive actually be really important in very tight matchups like this. No fortunate seeds, and as this third minion level drops, two. both teams get level back two. Away. The other thing we have to point out, we didn't see it in the mid lane, but Curl actually did go and steal away a Raptor from that camp, which is going to delay Clear Love's jungle experience a little bit. And they also got a ward in the red buff of Clear Love. So when he goes to do that camp, it's going to allow Prey and Gorilla much more freedom with the way they play the lane because they will have knowledge of where Clear Love started and where he is. And that's going to be happening right now as he crests into the red buff. And then yep. Rock Circus says, hey, bottom out. Olaf is top lane, bot lane completely free to push with impunity. And Svev, just be careful you don't push too hard because there is an Olaf near you. And that's just one of the many reasons Aurelian Sol can be so effective. It's almost impossible for Ryze to prevent that ward from being placed early on in the game, unless Clear Love were to have started on the red side and gone for a gank when he does Raptor Camp, which obviously didn't happen. Olaf, most of the time, starts to be So with Kara in the lineup, a lot of question marks were raised about will this change EDG? Because Mouse's performance, of course, wasn't of the highest caliber at World. Going for the play, he's going to land the root on Nakuro inside the minion wave. Mana. Couple more shots get landed, one more auto attack, and that is Ghost down, but a lot of health gone from Kuro. Just to finish the point on Kuro, the big thing was they weren't playing around top lane when they had Mouse in the lineup. Would they adjust it? Rumble does push in early, is at pressure of ganks, but for now, that phase has been skipped for EDG. Got to see how they play their way through this mid game. You're seeing a small gold lead for Rocks Tigers. A lot of it you're seeing in the top lane matchup. Already 27 to 17 here with Smeb over Koro. 
And Scout forgot that that got warded in the previous fight. Yeah, I actually don't like the fact that Scout's had his recall interrupted twice because I think it's fairly avoidable. Something that was completely non-existent when Rox has picked mid lane dominant picks in the past, like when they played Syndra, was the mid lane vision control. But they've actually fixed that at least early on in this game. Look at the vision control in the river. Pink ward in the brush, normal wards, over top of the brush in multiple lanes, not to mention they already have some brushes warded. So this makes it very difficult for Clear Love to make anything happen. And that's why it was always respected as a really innovative coach, especially in picks, mid lane Nautilus, other craziness that came out, especially in 2015. I like that we're seeing some in-game adaptation because when you're researching for Rocks Tigers, the team playing around Kuro, especially in the early game, is never really one of your top 10 concerns when you're facing this team but instead you're seeing them play around their stronger side. And coming into this matchup, you expected Smeb to be one to bully around Koro. Smeb, again, two-time LCK MVP. Even when Rox didn't win, they, he, was, he was still the, the most voted MVP player. Coming in, was he the best player in the world coming into the World Championship? So far, he has not played like the literal best player in League of Legends, but now up against someone who did not even play a game during the summer split, and he is blasting this lane open. Yeah, and it's fairly early as well, before they've even been able to go back to shop. The laning phase for Smeb in the group stage was much below his expectations, for sure. He had a lot of uncharacteristic deaths, and then was still able to transition to team fights. but you expect more from Smeb. And now, Koro decides to stick around. Pretty dangerous without vision control, but with Peanut on the bottom side of the map, it's most likely going to be safe. You are seeing these mid laners trade back and forth. Of course, a moderate minion deficit right now for Scout in the mid lane after losing those two recalls and being late back to lane. But it's still Rox Tigers, the squad that's playing more aggressively, finding the plays. Peanut right now in the fog of war. And Mako is like, do I want to check this? Gets away from the root. And he's fine. And a little bit lucky to be fine, actually, because you saw the vision toggle there. They have very little control of this map right now after EDG. And this was the fear after this draft phase where multiple lanes for EDG are getting pushed into the turret, which doesn't buy them the time to get vision control anywhere that's necessary. And Clear Love now isn't necessarily spotted, but Rox is hunting. Walk into two, just kidding. Around the side he goes, gets the double slow. He goes away. Yeah, he actually burns a ghost summoner spell for that. He doesn't even have boots, so getting away would be hard otherwise. That's actually a pretty big summoner to blow at level five, soon to be level six. The Ragnarok gangs at six have been super common as the trading continues in mid for now. We're getting pressured out. We've only seen him shop once, I'm sure. Another shop coming in for Kuro. And you're seeing how close these two mid laners are actually fighting. Both mana pools are getting dangerously low over and over. Kuro is hard shoving and then recalling. He's, this is, I think, his third recall now. He got one, it's back for Boots, once for the Dark Seal, now for Boots too as well. But Scout's also constantly running out of mana, and these blue buffs are incredibly important to hand over because imagine Scout had a full mana pool, he could have forced a flash at a Kuro possibly. Yeah, the one thing you want Peanut and Kuro to actually do more of is try and get vision control towards that seven minute respawn of the blue buff because that is a potential way of shutting down Scout. As of now though, since Scout's gotten the blue buff, he's looking for a play. Do they realm warp in or do they walk? Also a gank top side. All right, double size the Whoa. flash knockback. Here's the ward up in the kick as well. Oh. Lands the sonic wave. That's first blood in for Peanut. Meanwhile, Prey has to do just that. He's running it out. Clear love. Ash gonna lose his life. A kill in for Prey. Rocks Tigers still not saying die. Finally, the kills come through for Scout. Two to two overall. But Kuro is not done. Voice of Flight tags Mako. Flash the chase. Oh in. my goodness. He's gonna try to get some of it, but they're inside the orbit. They're not taking any damage. He finally gets one and gets oh. away with it. Kuro makes it 3 2. Rocks Tigers. And such a close series of events right there. The gank top was golden, but that just allowed EDG safety with their gank bottom, and Kuro was a little bit late to the roam. So close to being a triple kill for Scout, which could have had huge implications over the game, but as they trade it back, it ends up actually being a two for two bottom side and a positive play top side. We might actually see some more information. So far, Jace is staying top. We don't have the vision toggle just yet. There he is. Koro does have flash. Does he use it? Peanut is around. Koro going to go for the 1v2. Plenty of damage to deal to the Rock Tigers jungler. Oh! And at least he trades it back. That's the best it could have been right here. Koro burns his flash for no avail, but at least trades a kill back. And quite critical, actually, that both of those kills have gone to Peanut. So even though Smeb does get an experience edge, he's not going to completely slingshot him in gold. Only 400 gold could be much worse for Koro. See another push in, you're seeing and hearing the crowd chant for EDG. Their fans are here in attendance, hoping to cheer on their region's number one team. And what is a close game so far? This is the 
bot lane gangster was actually the realm walk. Very smart to actually put it behind the turret. They knew they were going for a dive. Four men committed to the bot side. We already saw the kill in top. Philip actually doesn't use Ragnarok to start. He yeah. ends up taking an extra turret shot he didn't need to. This could have actually been better for ADG. I feel like Clearlove misplayed that. He should have been running in with Ragnarok over top of the trap, but then Scout flashes out of the ultimate from Curl, and a lot of shields come through all across the board. Deft doesn't stick for the last auto attack because he was afraid an orb plus a turret shot would kill him, but he most likely could have finished that kill onto Kuro. And Scout himself actually picked a, a different combo from what he could have on Rise. He put two spells in between the overload to grant himself a shield, but he wasn't the one taking damage, so he missed an overload to shield himself from damage that never came in his way, and that kill would have gone through probably before Mako would have died. And because of the repeat gang top, obviously not ideal to trade one for one in the second half of it. Smeb did actually get to push the minions in, he did get the advantage of Koro using his teleport to return to lane, so the CS difference up top has grown, and Jace can run away with the lane against Rom. I actually feel like this entire Rocks team has the potential to run away with the game if Smeb and Kuro get the mid-game power spike and then transition to a lot of turret dives like Rocks is known to do when they're at their best. EDG does still have to hold on. They're 1,000 gold now. They need to hold on for a lot longer. I mean, it's 1,000 gold, and they have to hold on because of the itemization. We didn't even touch on it, but double tier to start the game from Ryzen as your very old uh, power trough that's been well covered, but still a relevant one here. So they're spending their gold in items that will pay off later. We haven't seen the Rod of Ages yet either. So the window for EDG is around 25 minutes. Wow, and look at that top lane turret already dead below 11 minutes. Here's a quick 1,100 gold for the team. Rocks Tigers ballooning now to 2.4 thousand ahead. Really, really significant lead for this squad. And we also wondered how Clearlove would attempt to play around that top side. Even though Mouse struggled in his games in the group stage, Clearlove actually spent a decent amount of time kind of trying to rescue that lane. Here, Clearlove does walk up right at the very end, but only as the turret falls, and he spent his time elsewhere. So this is the strategy they're trying to go for. They're going to try and deal with Smeb and Peanut, trying to feast on Koro, who's on his own, and try and win the rest of the map. So far, hasn't worked out great. They have gotten two kills for Scout, which I think is very beneficial. And honestly, EDG could have had a much worse start than this. I think they should be happy with the top lane going down, but Scout having two kills. And look, EDG famously bot lane focused, especially in the LPL, all about clear love, setting up Deft and Mako, who either get their own advantage or get snowboard from the jungler. Very important to say that against a Caitlyn lane, for once, they're actually in a good spot. They got the gank, they got the preferential backs. The karma adaptation means they can have the wave in the right spot. And in general, they are keeping ahead of Rock's Tigers <laughs> and even canceling a back oh. cheekily as well. Nicely done. Eight seconds bot right there. As Prey's gonna have to delay his uh, run back. Looks like Clearlove was able to last hit the Scuttle Crab at the bottom river. Fought Peanut for that and did a better job. So a few small games for Edward Gaming, but it's still 2K deficit. Yep, the 2K deficit, and that's what Rox is going to try and punish right now. Even though Deft does have a CS advantage in the bottom side, Scout's yet to really complete any of his major items. Rai's still pretty powerful with just the chair and the catalyst to be completely fair, but the Drake is going to be where Rox looks to make their big advantage. Rox doesn't necessarily have a good tank line in this game, but they have enough damage that if they can draw EDG toward the Drake, that's when I expect them to pounce. Peanut soling out the Drake in this situation. The numbers for Rox are really interesting. We saw at the start of the game, 10 minutes, then negative 700 gold, which not a great deficit. It. You know, it's probably going to have to duck out the back here. From to 15 minutes, it goes to negative 75 gold. They continue to poke around the Drake. But from 15 to 20, there's actually a 1,200 gold shift. And we're coming towards that 15-minute mark. But from there, it's consistently, Rocks have got ahead. Mid game still looks pretty good. Teleport coming in. Very late Great TP. EG must want to fight. Here could be the fight. Peanuts rooted up. Nearly goes down. Swagger so wants to buy some time. The knockout comes through in a flash to get Peanut to safety. The chase still for Edward Gaming. Can they get the damage they need? Looks like not. Rocks Tigers take the Drake, get away, and save the TP, of course, for Smep. So that's an advantage they also get. A little surprising on the set of events that happened right there is EDG. We're a little bit late to pull the trigger going in there. Koro teleports as the Drake falls. So Rox doesn't have anything left to fight over, and they use the acceleration gate from Jace to disengage pretty close on a lot of those fights, and they actually end up burning four to five summoners defensively to get away from that. But I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Koro was known for teleport when he was playing, but again, has been out of the competitive scene for a long time. There is going to be those teething problems, especially in game one. There's scrim comms and there's stage comms. And for here, we're seeing a little bit of a discrepancy between the two for ADG. And speaking of discrepancies, I love 
how these teams are kind of approaching the game. Edward Gaming putting a lot of their focus on the bottom lane. They have the entire tournament of the seven games, not counting this one they've played so far in the tournament. Six of those, the first turret they killed was bot lane. Uh, Deft is the damage shared leader of all AD carries here at Worlds. It is about this AD carry on Edward Gaming. Meanwhile, Rock's Tigers are tunneling pretty hard on getting Smeb ahead. Peanuts ganks have been up there, two of their kills. This is the first time Rocks have taken top lane turret as their first turret the entire tournament. I mean, analysts across the world were scratching their heads with both Rocks and EDG and Groups, but this is definitely the one where you're like, okay, my research pays off. Turns out you want to get Smeb ahead, and it turns out that EDG want to get Deft and Mako ahead. Finally, League of Legends makes sense. It's taken <laughs> quite a long time of Worlds, but so far so good in this series. Yeah, and even if you look at this game, you also have to wonder which lane is EDG thinking they're going to be able to kill first. After the draft, assuming the game plays out in a normal fashion, Rox almost always takes the first turret in this matchup. EDG need to make sure it's just that one turret and keep it pretty close so that they can win team fights because that's what they've drafted for here with the Rise and the Rumble. And so far, 2,000 gold is not that bad, really, when I, I keep saying it, considering the early game laning of Rocks. In the late game, Rocks need to be ahead because this is a team that wants to have pink wards down, catch someone when they're coming. Because if they try to face check and put down a ward, maybe Lee Sin has a tricky ward hop to get out. But otherwise, they're so squishy that putting down counter vision when they're behind, there's a gold deficit 30 minutes in. Their options to actually fight over objectives are limited. They are truly a pure damage, pure pick team. That is true. There's kind of limited tank options. You're even seeing Peanuts build actually focus on a Hex Sprinker second item to go with his Warrior Enchant. So it's really not a big front line here for Rox Tigers. And you know Ryze and Ezreal can cut through those champions. I mean, Peanut only ever has the attack damage and ability power tabs <laughs> open on his shop. He doesn't know anything about tank. This guy's never bought Locket on a lease. Full damage <laughs> at all points. And he sticks with the lease in as well. But the root doesn't quite land there on a Mako. Karma's able to run away. Death with the shield. And the snipe not going to mean too much. Good Arcane Shift to get away with it. Yeah, Deft, a very good mechanical player. Always expect him to wait to Arcane Shift until you've thrown your skill shot, and then instead of just blindly shifting away, he will actually look at the direction of your skill shot to make sure he shifts away from it. So expertly done right there. Also, EDG have completed the Rod of Ages. They're hoping for the Muramana Transform around 20 minutes, and then they'd be hitting their Power Spike. If they can synchronize that with the Andrews before they get snowballed on, it would be very good for them. But Rox does not want to give them time. Nice aggression from Rox. Tiger's already surrounding on this bottom outer turret, but the mini wave is cleared away thanks to Death's True Shot Mirage. If he hadn't have cast that, the turret probably would have fallen. But that was still just one roam from Kuro. He might revisit on the next wave, and it might go down soon. A little intriguing item point. It is actually an Infinity Edge straight up rushed by Prey. It isn't BF Sword Pickaxe into a Hurricane, which means that Caitlyn's going to be going mid and matching wave clear. The advantage here is that Ghost Flash Aurelian Soul, if he's in the mid lane, can reach top and bot so quickly that it's actually nice to have him out push rise and go across the map rather than be anchored to bottom top, at least for now, 17 minutes in. Absolutely agree. There's a lot of dynamic plays possible for Rocks Tigers here, and so far they have held onto this 2,000 gold lead ever since they got that top lane turret down. And with that outer turret gone, there's not much else to pressure. They've got to find other parts of the map to push, but they're finding that their opponents here, the opposition, a bit stronger, you might say. Scout doing pretty well for himself. Actually, has gotten a uh, minion kill lead back. But now he's looking for top lane tier two, forced the early flash out of Kuro. He ults to kill the minion wave, not knowing that he's just gonna die himself. That's gonna be a kill put through, but he will save the turret for now and buy time for the rest of the, the team to do something else, maybe. Yeah, Kuro really underestimating the damage there of Smeb and Kuro as they fly in right there. The alt, if placed more on himself, potentially could have kept him alive. And Peanut was even there to prevent anyone else from EDG collapsing during that dive. Rocks have really taken control of that side of the map. It's a nice way to win a game. Play to your strengths, make sure nothing else goes badly, and continue to knock that down. If it weren't for the equalizer, the turret probably would have fallen. You watch this gank again. I mean, watching yeah. this replay, it feels like he could have layered it on the minion wave because you want to pick up some minions even if you die, and also to dissuade a dive. But it either he gave in or just misjudged the situation completely, was blown up. When Jace goes as offensive as these no tier Jace builds allow, the more Malmordius into Black Cleaver doesn't take many shots to kill someone. Thankfully for Koro, Rumble is pretty useful even if he doesn't have many items. The Leandri's Torment, the really core one that you need in that champion, and he'll at least be useful, but the problem is it is still a point of pressure that Rocks continue to push at and gain advantages from.
Yeah, I do want to mention, though, that it's still just the one turret down for the Rox Tigers. The game is teetering on a knife's edge right here. If Rox is able to take down these three other turrets, it's going to be a gargantuan goal dude, that I don't think EDG will be able to overcome in team fights. But if they keep this up and they get a good Realm Warp in, they have a chance. Looking for the play on the bot lane. Gorilla running out of health rapidly. The first kill going to come through. And oh, Hanaluf is just running out of HP. He's going to shift out of this one and run for your dear life. Poro finishes the teleport to buy some time for the rest of his team. Will they get much going on, though? Looks like the chase still continuing as Rox Tigers really want some more kills. Mako eats a cupcake. He goes and comes back in towards Pita, but Koro taking all of his life and damage gonna get dropped down for it. He turns around and gets killed for the uh, transgression. And it's a one for zero. Rox Tigers coming out ahead. Really not impressed with Clear Love's Olaf right there. With a few better axe throws and auto attacks, that would have been a dead sire at the start of that fight. And then the turnaround does show the rust of them playing with Coral. The Equalizer comes in. While it was good to have it, he then gets caught up in Gorilla's Snare, who should have been dead at the start of the fight. So a misplayed fight there by EDG cost them. And you can't excuse lack of Ragnarok initiation on the turret dive either. Rock's looking for more than just the turret. And land the Q, the flash, the chase, the slow, and a clear the kick into the wall. The kill comes through. Kuro with the orbiting stars, and more comes through for the Rox Tigers. Now at depth, stun's gonna land. Double kill for the mid laner. One more chase for Spab. Actually gonna run away from this one. Doesn't want it out of the turret, and wisely gets away in time. But there's plans to tank. There's a mini wave here. This turret could go down. And this is vintage Rox Tigers turning on the acceleration. No chase pun intended. After 15 minutes, up to 5,000 already. Second turret taken on this push. This is what Rox Tigers did so well in LCK Summer, and it's. A pleasure to see them back on the Rift in this fashion. Yep, the Knife's Edge we were talking about, the game just fell off of it because yep. Rox has a huge lead right now. 6,000 roughly and a Drake that they should be able to take because they've taken so much control of the bottom side. We're going to watch this one more time. What is it with Rox members escaping on low health with yep. no one just wanting to finish off kills? Clear Love threw his axe too far initially, could not pick it up, and then did not have an axe to execute Gorilla. Now keep in mind, Gorilla's still in the back of the fight. He should be dead right now, assuming proper play, as EDG is retreating. So, they retreat into the turret, Kina doesn't get the ultimate down, and then Curl thinks, okay, time to turn it. He moves up, then gets caught by the Grasping Roots. Peanut can then execute him there. This fight could have actually been much different with different execution from EDG. But Rox, always the ones to execute properly, have to give them the credit. They turn the game in their favor. Um, from Rox, is still something a little different, guys. That's what we have to talk about. Is that SKT ran this comp a lot. These Jace top, they look great with it. 3-0 in the group stage. But Rox haven't been running these kind of delicate comps. They're more known to throw themselves for kills, as we saw in that replay, as we saw in the last passage, rather than ward up all their flanks and play really conservative League of Legends. This is not a conservative team. So the fact that they can close this out is still left up for debate. It's still a nice lead at 21 minutes. And good, but there's always a chance for the comeback. We can see mid lane outer going down as well, and that makes it four to zero in turrets with again that six thousand gold lead. Edward Gaming during the replay was able to pick up that Cloud Drake for themselves. Rock Tigers chose to reset and not go for the objective. So there's some things for EDG here. And as Papa Smithy is saying, there is always some risk with a bunch of squishies. Maybe it does fall over. Correct. The squishies are a concern for the Rock Tigers, but unlike some other compositions that are full of damage dealers. This is a spectacular sieging team that the Rocks Tigers have put together. We've seen the combination fairly often of Aurelian Soul, who I consider a setup champion, and Prey, who I consider a carry champion. So when they sit outside of a turret with the traps, as well as the Aurelian Soul orbs flying around, as well as the Zyra, the ability to engage and stop that siege is really low by the other team because they essentially would be engaging into exactly what Rox, and Rox wants them to. And they don't have the cannon, right? That's famous for those flank engages, the lightning rush and the ultimate. They really have the Rise Realm Warp as their realistic initiation. They've tried it a couple of times, gone a bit wide. And if we can see Gorilla ape what was done in the previous series by Wolf and his ability to control any sort of initiation. You just play, plan it down where you see the Realm Warp coming, and you're pretty safe, at least relatively so, for the Rock Siege. I see that Siege continue very shortly. There seems to be really nothing in Rock's Tiger's way as they continue to push towards what might be a World Championship title to them. They can knock down the rest of the teams in their way. Wave clear from Edward Gaming, gonna buy some time for now, but it's just, it's Rox Tiger's map to, to do whatever they want with, waiting for objectives to spawn, looking for turrets to kill, champions to assassinate as they send their various members across the map. Peanut gonna control topside jungle vision as it's gonna be Kuro pushing in that wave.
Yeah, and they're trying, they're trying to make sure that all of their waves are pushing at the same time. Coral being bottom is a slight concern for them, but Rock's Tigers know when they should execute. They have a mid lane wave pushing right now, and watch the setup here. Aurelian Soul will probably be in the mid lane with the next wave, and then you'd want the Caitlyn to set up right there. Uh, but it was actually cleared away preemptively by EDG, and they're going to get the bottom side turret. The turret might fall, but he's got company coming down. The Zyra and the Jace played by Smep here, looking to cut off Coral 1, and he's got no teammates around him. So Smep, how much CC is going to go for? Get the acceleration, and that's going to be a nice flash to get away from the, to the skies. If he had landed that, he'd be slowed, and the kill probably would have come through. It's the one small gap in Rox's comp, and talking again about the damage, is that Peanut has a locket, but he has no armor. So actually taking Baron, which is what you want to do, what would, what would stop or force a teleport from Korra, because they have complete control of the enemy red side jungle, for now is unrealistic, even though they have so much damage to actually take the Baron. Yeah, I think the Zyra will help substantially for Rox when taking that Baron. The plants can take a lot of the hits, and that can help Peanut in that regard. But also, as far as setting up the sieges, I actually felt like Prey's trap line was too far back in that situation. He placed the traps at the fallen middle turret instead of in front of the interior turret on the mid lane side. All those traps have since been cleared away when Rock backed away, but if they set up that siege again, I would hope Prey actually places his traps further forward so they can take down the turret. There's just never be breathing room for Scout to be bottom lane without teleport. Sure, Realm Warp is a quasi-global, but it doesn't get you to Baron Pit from bot, and Baron will become a realistic objective when we see, say, a dead man's plate or just some armor on Topina. We'll see what these players can do right now. Rox Tigers have been controlling top river control pretty well. You recently saw Def's True Shot Barrage come through the Baron Pit to give them a brief glimpse of vision to put some wards down. And they say, well, we've got enough top control. Let's go for the top lane tier two. Not even a problem. No contest here for Edward Gaming. And that's five turrets now to one. Rox Tigers once again hitting that 6,000 gold that they've maintained since the 20 minute mark. And making it very difficult for EDG to find their way back in a game. This is also a team that does not give up, even if you fall back to the group stage. The game they played against AHQ towards the end, where if EG would have lost, they would have been out of the tournament, they were facing a 10,000 gold deficit against that AHQ team, but were still able to pull the game back with some clutch team fights in the Baron Pit. So that is what EDG would be hoping for. Unfortunately for them, Rock Tiger is much better with a gold lead. Core one respecting the vision deficit there. Says, ah, yeah, skill shot. All right, duke around. Nice, thanks very much. They did it pretty well, but it's still Edward Gaming trying to claw back a very dark map. You see, Grillo just put a ward down, but the problem is the pink ward in that pit, so all someone has to do is walk in that little circle, and the ward goes away once again. Prey going to grab his red buff, and it looks like Rox Tigers have all the tools they really need. Next Drake spawns in 40 seconds. Yeah, EDG have kind of been inching wards towards the Baron. They've never really been in a position to put wards down. A second Mountain Drake, and again, we creep closer to Rox, just DPSing down a Baron instantly, so a good... Uh, Drake spawn for Rox Tigers, the second mountain. Absolutely. Double mountain is super great in the late game. Really helps closing these out. And the Rox Tigers didn't need any of the earlier game focus ones like an Ocean Drake to get through the laning phase and smash these things open. So, based on the way the game is already going, I gotta say that feels pretty good for them. Once again, mid lane gonna be cleared away. And we once again check their lane assignments. No one right now contesting Coro. He gets to shove the top lane out. And no one's stopping Clear Love and Co. from clearing the mid lane wave because Rox Tigers care more about the Drake. And I think EDG should be completely okay with Rox taking this Drake. This is standard play across the board. Rox is taking the bottom side Drake, which means EDG is going to attempt to steal on it, but basically use this time to reestablish some semblance of vision control around the Baron side, because ultimately, if EDG is going to come back in this, it's going to be when Rox goes for the Baron. Exactly. This exact play that is the hopeful beginning of an Edward Gaming comeback. They say, well, first of all, Scout facing Smed. The nice flash into the knockback. Flashed away from Brilliant Soul. Ghost burned as well. Voice of Light Highlight. flash. The damage is going to be enough. They try. They're not quite going to get it on a Scout, but how about to re-engage Smed? Running out of health. This flash is down, and Edward Gaming actually find a comeback kill. 45 seconds of 5v4. Can they get anything else for it? I think it's unlikely that they get something for that, but it will definitely stall the game. This is the time where Rock should be re-establishing vision control on the Baron side of the map, but Smeb thinks he can get a kill because he expects Kuro to be able to make the roam, and it feels like Scout just baited him, and the rest of EG came out of the base. Smeb went way too far without backup, and it cost him. Yeah, it was overly high feed, definitely. He missed the first EQ, which would have been the burst. They probably would have had the damage taken down there. Instead, they used everything. Even Kuro used double summoners to try to make that kill happen, so it buys some time 
for EDG. For now, no other damage, just Peanut dueling with Koro. He's got the teammates coming. Zyra just below, down on that side of the map. Aurelion Soul coming as well. That's that yellow orb on your screen. Koro able to get away, not burning any summoners. And here's the rest of Edward Gaming. Sveb has teleport. Oh. And here's the re-engage. Two members already picked off. Make that three, Koro. Doesn't even need to snipe a double kill for Koro in the mid lane for Rocks Tigers. And that was a 5v4, theoretically. Smeb wasn't really part of that fight, and it gets smashed. What an absurd combo from Gorilla and Kuro there, catching the Grasping Roots. Now they turn for Baron. Smep be damned, he fell down. The rest of Rocks did a 4v5. Double Mountain, so, so easy. The fact that they turned, they realized that Rumble still had Flash. Taking him down wasn't trivial. Turned on the other two members, and this is the team playing at their best. Clear communication yeah. between the five Korean players. It looked like Koro was their only target, but when they saw the reinforcements, that's when they realized they could get more. And to be fair, Clear Love just missed the Realm Warp when Scout was coming in, so that's why he's late to the fight. He actually doubled back towards the Realm Warp before getting there, but they Realm Warped straight into his Iris, so they were all going to eat the CC anyway. Probably a fight where they should have just allowed Koro to continue to run away and taken it as a zero for zero. Rox then gets EDG for those kills. And maybe a little bit of desperation saying, if we make the comeback, maybe it's got to be right now. Hopefully they overextended. Of course, that was not the case. A better played team fight by Rox Tigers. They get Baron Nasher as well. It is a 9,000 gold lead. The number one team from South Korea looking to balloon this even farther. Pressure on the final tier two turret in the bot lane. And I'm super happy to see Gorilla adapting to one of these more squishy ranged mage supports. His bard at the start of summer season was unacceptable. Very poor, died frequently. 10, 11 deaths. It was actually the highest average death player in the whole of LCK for the first half of the season. But now he's playing the Zara. A pick he hasn't played since 2013. So bringing it back because it's in the tournament meta. And the fact that he could turn on an instant and get that double snare was great stuff from Gorilla. Yeah, many of the Korean supports have looked great on Zyra this tournament in particular. And I'm really looking forward to seeing if Rox can close this game out decisively because this is one of their most powerful windows with the Baron, with the Aurelian Sol, trapping up the base. Will Prey be able to eat down this turret and can they open up multiple inhibitors? He's not going to give them a chance just yet. Equalizer comes across and at least buys some time. Health bar is getting hit a little bit, but looks like Rock Tiger is still okay getting the damage across the enemy champions they can and healing up well enough. The next wave is probably just another siege. He's going to wait for Aurelian Soul to push up the bot wave and meet as well. Still has Baron buff, so those minions will come very soon. All five from Rocks need to be there. They cannot afford to have Kuro looking for cheeky auto attacks on the bot lane turret because they are squishy. They can be zerged down. They get poked down a little low with no Rumble ult to no Ezreal ult though. The engage is less likely. Prey took oh, a lot of damage. Prey gets chunked, but Kuro goes into the mix and clear love dangerously low as well. A lot of health bars looking at this point, but it's still no casualties on either side. A bit of chip damage still happened. And Rock Tigers feel pretty good about that. Yeah, Peanut had to use ultimate defensively. Kuro has no health, so realistically, even though they probably would have got the turret on the next wave, the health bars weren't high enough for it to be safe. They just go back to really pushing up the map. And I think it is the smart choice. When you're the team up 10,000 gold, getting closer to 50-50 in a team fight is, is the way you let the comeback happen. So they say, hey, a full minute left of Baron buff, reset, get back to the lanes, and it looks like Rock Tigers are still in complete control. Especially if either Kuro or Peanut get taken out, it's very trivial to just mow down the rest. They need there to be some threat of tankiness or damage in the front line. Otherwise, they're in trouble. Whoa! There's the giant stun from base. Not gonna land the stun on anybody just yet, but ooh, is Peanut looking for the knockback, but not gonna find it. Maybe overstepping. Jumps to a minion, running out of health pretty rapidly, but they don't quite have the damage output. He goes buys a little bit more time, and he's not quite gonna burn down Gorilla. The kill in the Koro, and now it's Edward Gaming forced to retreat once again. Clear love slowed down, chased out. Kuro is not going to be stopped. Finally, let's get away back to his base, but it is a 5v4 that Rocks Tigers secure the middle inhibitor with. And how many fights have we seen Rocks Tigers get away with? with slivers of health. And while it is attractive to just say, ah, EDG should be finishing these kills, Rock's Tigers do know their limits, and they are very slippery dodging skill shots towards the end of fights. Uh, most of them know their limits. Peanut actually went for an insect play with no kick available, so that was a little bit awkward. End up being a zoning war jump, I guess you could say. That's the nicest way to put it. Bit of a mess up yeah. there, but it worked. They got the inhibitor. They got what they came for. At the end of the day, they get the turret, the inhibitor, no one dies, and they get a kill on Coral. Worth. So all of those things are completely worth. Well, 
It is 11,000 gold that puts Rocks Tigers ahead right now. It's a best of five. There are several more games to play, but right now all the Korean fans can be exceptionally happy at how their team is doing right now. Once again, look at the play on Scout. He is able to dodge some of the skill shots and actually flash away for a few more seconds. Maybe Peanut finds the re-engage. In fact, might just do so. Flash the Q gets the kill with the kick. Nicely done there by Peanut, turning one in. And Edward Gaming is still the one-man show. Def doing almost half of his team's damage this game. And no one else pitching in enough. Might have been surprised to see that kick damage. Of course, there's a serrated jerk in the infantry of Peanut. Why not? Gonna work towards the more. He's tanky enough with these pseudo tank items that he's picked up. And that's a third Mountain Drake. So if they even just put down some traps, taking a turret is gonna be trivial. Yeah, that's 30% additional true damage on objectives like turrets, Drake, and Baron. So very easy pushing for prey. And as far as the sidelines are concerned, EDG has done that extra plus one that they didn't need to on a lot of these waves. They're getting the wave pushed out, and then they're going one step too far and leading to pick after pick. They still have pretty good wave clear, though. They do, and they have Scout back up in about five seconds, and Realm warping outside of your own base after level 11 to find a flank play is definitely an attractive option for breaking sieges. The bear buff has timed out, and maybe EDG find that opening. Yeah, based on the 13,000 gold difference, EDG needs to land a substantial amount of poke before they try a realm warp play. Otherwise, they get obliterated. The problem with that, Rox has more poke, so yep. generally EDG will always be lower on health. See Smep doing a lot of work with this one. Kuro also holding the front line quite nicely. All this really is still durable enough to make it scary. Clear love running on the team, getting nothing done for it. Kuro's dominating. A nice ulti by Gorilla disengages. It's already two kills picked up for Rocks Tigers with what could be the end game push right now. 35 minutes in, triple Mountain Drake, five versus three for 40 seconds. Looking now for Nexus Turret, looking to be another team into the semifinals. If they can do this and more, the three man defense, Mako, not long for this world. Exhaust is not enough. The dive out of the Fountain Peanut nearly loses his life for it. Was able to safeguard back away. The flash to re-engage, looking for a little bit more damage. And it's still only two members alive. Edward Gaming will not be able to defend this one. Scout's going to lose his life at the end of it all. Death, the last man standing. Nexus falls. Rocks Tigers convincingly take down game one. Welcome back to the big stage, Rocks Tigers. They had a five-game slumber, but three games in a row, they've looked like the team that captured everyone's hearts finally took down an LCK championship, and have finally shown up at Worlds. Exactly, they were feasting on Koro in the top lane in this game. Peanut and Smev made repeated visits up there, not to mention Kuro was also on a strong champion that could have impact in the game and not get pushed into the laning phase. I really loved their draft as well as their play this game because they were shoving almost every single lane and then when they needed to transition it to the big advantage, they did. And it means so much going forward as well, especially on blue side. When they're on blue side, you're on red side, you have to ban Elise in Italy. Now you have Aurelian Soul. Now you have a champion you have to ban from Kuro. Always the afterthought when you're drafting against the Rocks Tigers. The Aurelian Soul looked much more on point this time than last time, clearly been practicing. And that's another headache for EDG. Yeah, and when I look at the side of EDG, they did draft themselves into a bit of a losing situation that would require them to play their way out of it because most of their lanes were getting shoved in. And you're thinking that Clear Love was put in a very bad situation because he couldn't make games ha ganks happen if his lanes are pushed in. But at the end of the day, he has to play better mechanically. So many missed axes and missed kills because of mechanical misplays did cost EDG pretty heavily in this game. So I wonder if they go for the all-off again. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because Edward Gaming as much as they are about the bottom lane, it felt like the bottom lane was the only players even playing well in this game. Deft actually obliterated the damage charts, nearly triple what his mid laner did. 31,000 damage from the Ezreal, 11k from the Rise. This was a first pick red side Rise. This was a high priority champion. Like, yes, we secured Scout this Rise pick. Mm -hmm. And he did absolutely nothing. He, he made a roam happen, I guess, to be fair. Yep. And with those two kills, he did less damage than the one in five Kuro, Kuro in the top lane, did a third of the damage of his AD carry. And it feels like more if he needed to step up. Either way, though, a beautiful game from Rockstar. It's a great way to start the series for sure. So now, let's send it to the analyst desk to break down that Tigers game win. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That's exactly right. Rocks Tigers going to be very happy to pick up game one and in dominating fashion here. Uh, ultimately, though, I want to start from the very beginning because we had questions around, you know, champion picks given the fact that EDG had this emergency substitution. We haven't seen Koro play in a while. And we were talking about the possibility of putting him on a tank. Of course, the Poppy was banned out but Rumble being the opted-in pick here. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really terrible situation for Koro in the first place because he's picking against the Jace. And like, yeah, he could have gone for a tank. 
in some sort, but no puppy is going. You can't really go Maokai up there. You can't really go Echo against Jace either. There's really nothing he can pick in this situation that can beat the Jace against Smep. So he goes for the team fighting pick and is like, I'm going to try and survive. You guys go bot lane and then later we join together. But that just gave such an easy opening for Rox to camp a lane. But to his credit, I mean, double flash burnt first time. He comes back second time, gets a return kill. He probably played that laning phase as best as you can when they're willing to throw that many sure. resources at you. Then his decision making got a little bit shaky as the ganks kept coming. The first two were actually played very well. And then he started flashing a little bit trigger happy and uh, the it's just a slippery slope. Well, it's also incredibly difficult to play the laning phase in the side lanes when you're dealing with Aurelian Soul. Just give Aurelian Soul to Kuro. Don't bother about laning. Just never be there. Push and roam, push, roam. And if you can roam to the top side, it's the implication that he's going to top that makes him have to back off. I mean, you know that Aurelian Soul can roam at level one. We saw CLG do it to Rox. I'm sure they picked this up themselves, especially with the likes of maybe a Caitlyn. And... You kind of have to give him some credit, although I think that the pick might have been a little bit difficult, maybe a NAR. Again, the uh, problem is the fact that you give away Jace, you don't have a pick against it, so mm -hmm. that now means for next game, if you don't have, a, uh, if you don't have an answer, you got to ban the Jace, mm -hmm. and then suddenly you got to remove some of the jungle bans, maybe, or you got to remove at least the Jin ban, but then you also look at Aurelian Soul, which I think is the perfect pick for Rocks Tigers in the mid lane, because it's not about their mid lane, it's about the side lanes. Aurelian Soul is all about going to side lanes and snowballing side lanes. So you got two picks I'm looking at Jace who can snowball so hard for Smep and top in a skill matchup and then Aurelian Soul that can impact all the lanes. Both of these picks have insane high value for Rock Tigers and have to be removed. Yeah, game one was evidence to me that champ select is going to be a very tough puzzle for EDG to crack. But now I want to kind of identify the play styles with which each of these teams approach the game with our first replay here. Cross map, we've got Rocks focusing in on the top lane while EDG goes by. So we figured that Rocks will be focusing the top side. This is a nice little flash from Smeb on top of another flash from Peanut. But on the reverse side, we're going to see EDG going for it, but this is going to be the world's worst Lumberjack. I don't know what Clearlove is doing. He pretty much lost this play for EDG. Yeah, and you know, this in the end nearly was a three for one still with EDG going down. Maker actually gives dangerous game over to Kuro at the back end of this play. Miss and it ulti. means they will be able to do it. Sure, Death Miss ulti and a couple of Qs here, but realistically, this is going to be a theme of the game. EDG under pressure, not mechanically executing, and Rox Tigers stepping up and getting away on slithers of health and turning that into yep. big advantages. It just looks like the rig carnival for all the abilities that kept getting missed. I'm not sure what EDG was doing. You know, we know this team as being one that can play in the best of fives, but for opening up like this, I'm a little bit worried. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you can be nervous for your first game, but Rox Tigers, they were able to execute when it mattered, and that's a problem because we look at the pick and ban phase and say that's going to be in favor of Rox Tigers due to flexibility. We look at the early game and say, okay, that's probably also a bit strong for Rox Tigers because of the SMEP on top side. If you can't mechanically then execute when you actually get a chance to pick up kills, then there's no way you're going to win this game. And that is such a big problem, something we don't normally see when you look at top eight teams in the world. And let's go ahead and take a look at Nace replay that shows just how good rocks can be. Party in the bot lane. Everyone's invited, but that doesn't mean everyone's going to have fun. Let's look at Clearlove. And one uh, more time, Clearlove actually gets unlocked here, and the CC's burnt early, so he should be able to chase him down. Goes looking for an axe, stumbles over his own shoelaces. <laughs> yeah, like, sadly for him, he didn't have vision actually in that bottom side bush so he couldn't hit the Zyra with auto attacks until he was inside the bush and then it was too late he ran away and now Koro is like hey I've done my job after this ulti let me just go back in for some reason my entire team is low and gone and I'm just gonna walk in and die and the biggest thing around this play is if you when you watch EDG play domestically all of the playmaking comes from the tank jungler and the tank support. They play Braum, they play Alistar, they play Rek'Sai, they play Gragas. When they are not the two champions that are hitting go, Mako on a very reactionary support, you can see how confused and lost this team looks in team fights. And then you try and make up for a loss, really. You try and stay around and see maybe we can catch a guy if someone stays to push a tower alone. Problem is, the guy wasn't alone. That's just beautiful in the end also. Uh, Swap stays alive, calculated. doesn't get the kill. But like, yeah, it's one of these problems we see from teams when they kind of panic. Like, oh, we just lost that play. Let's try and stay and see if we can get something in return. And that often means you just lose even more like they did here. Well, that's what I felt like how EDG was playing. Very reactive to what Rox was trying to do. We know that they were trying to go for the top side focus. And one of the key ways to play in League is that you want to have vision in the side that you want to be making plays. And we know that EDG wanted to focus onto the bottom side, but it looks like it was just a reaction to the top side. And that just is evident with the vision. All the vision from EDG was just defensive for Koro in the top side. And mm -hmm. that doesn't allow you to make anything happen on the map. Had the vision been bottom side, we might have seen more teleports from the rise and focusing more that lane. And 
that's what we want to see because we expect top lane to go down 50 CS and two kills. That's fine. Koro still did his job. It's the rest of the members of EDG that were so disappointing in this game. I want to see EDG on blue side. I don't want to see Nidalee being banned because I actually think they have to be able to first pick it. Yep. Instead, you remove Elise, you remove Array and Soul and Jace, and you remove some uh, of these strong soul landers. I know Clearlove hasn't always been the greatest Nidalee, but I think you have to trust in him right now. Or give him Elise first pick, one of the two. I mean, if Rex is not going to be there, I would rather see maybe even the likes of a Zac. He has such a massive champion pool. Maybe that champion is there. You got to get rid of one of the skill two shots. Remove the skill shots there. I want to see him on something that's easier. All right, but let me ask you this. We saw both teams utilize the playstyles that we expected coming in. We had Smeb with a 15, uh, or with a 31 CSD at 15, whereas we had Deft dealing 46% of his team's damage in this game. Clearly, that did not work for EDG. I mean, you've already mentioned it. EDG has selected blue side. They will be going to that side. Aside from champions, like, what can they change within the game to help themselves come up with a victory. Uh, I was just going to go with they need a bigger gun. I'm sick of seeing Ezreal <laughs> like, get a Jinx or a Twitch in there if you're going to do that much fair. damage. Actually, just play Protect the Death comp. I mean, we've seen them already run Karma mid lane, just get full supportive, because I think that that is a way that maybe you sneak a game. I have no idea anymore. That was just really poorly executed. <laughs> a couple ideas there for EDG, but Rox Tigers out to a nice lead here. 1-0 when we return. Rox Tigers and Edward Gaming are back in action for game two.